going. I am recording. Um, Tov, I want to do something uh, before we start that's connected to what we're going to do, <clears throat> but a little bit different than usual. Kind of put some couple things in perspective, uh, time-wise, because that's one of the things we tend to forget. I had a student today who is 14, and he doesn't have a strong background. And I asked him um, how long ago he thinks the Mishnah was written. Now, most, most kids, 14 years old, really don't have a good perspective on the timeline of Jewish history. And I didn't expect him to know. But he thought it was 300 years ago. So I said, it's almost 2,000 years. He said, no, Bennett? He couldn't believe that. So I gave him a whole um, history lesson, so to speak, from Har Sinai till not to today, but till the time of the Gemara, we still have more to do. <clears throat> so I just want to kind of point out a couple of things. Let me share with sound, share screen. Okay, we'll be all over here. I want to do um, kind of show you where we're holding here, as they say. If you take a look at the bottom here, you'll see the time period <clears throat> of what's called the kings and the prophets down over here. It's hard to see, let me make a drop bigger. You'll see here, it says Israel and Judah, Judah and Assyria. And if you look up here, you'll, we, you'll note, you'll note where I put this arrow. It says 720 BCE, exile the 10 tribes to, not by Assyria, by Assyria and also to Assyria. So in approximately 700 years before the common era, the Jews of the Northern Kingdom were exiled uh, more or less completely. And then it's not until 586 BC when the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. In this time period from 720 to 586 over here um, the, is the last vestige of uh, Malchut Yehuda. And it's the time period we're dealing with. We're approximately right now dealing with the year approximately 700 BCE. And also to give you a perspective, one second. Wanna, I need to. Move, I don't know where to move y'all on the screen here. So I can. I said we're approximately 700 BC. Also, to get your perspective of where we are physically, here's here's Israel. Here's Judah, Yehuda, that we're talking about now. This area, the light green, was the the Assyrian Empire as of approximately 671 BCE. So during this time period, they had the, a massive swath of land where it was considered the Assyrian Empire, and where they were taken into, into Galut, into some various areas over here. And of course, we know some were brought back into uh, the land of Israel, into the Shomron. Now, one more thing before we continue. <clears throat> Let me stay, do a stop share first. What we're going to be doing tonight is looking at a, I don't want to say soliloquy, a soliloquy is when an individual speaks, not as a discussion, but just one person speaks in, a, in an, an event. But more or less, Rav Shakeh is going to speak to these three leaders of Am Yisrael, or three people that work for King, Chis, King Chizkiyahu, within the earshot of the people. I mentioned there's also a bit of psychological warfare involved in this, not just a bit, but actually quite a bit of psychological warfare. And... Um, this speech is something that Rav Shake assumes is going to be very powerful and have a tremendous impact. He's kind of right. But I want to show you, I came across um, a cute little um, two-minute video that helps us understand the power of words. I want to explain to you what I'm talking about. You know, there's a, as kids, there was an expression used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but, na but names will never hurt me. It's exactly the opposite, by the way. The sticks and stones are the things that are temporary. The names that can stick with you forever. Think about whether it's yourself or your friends who were, a teacher said something, made a comment, a parent made a comment, they're a kid, scarred them for life. I had, had an uncle, I love his shalom, who died when he was in his mid seventies. And I know I've told the story before, but every time to the day he died, whenever he got called up to the Torah, he would shake like a leaf. I mean, you could hear his voice cracking. And that's because 
at his bar mitzvah, after he finished his aliyah, the rabbi of the shul came over and made a fun of him how he made the bracha, because he made a mistake. That stuck with him his entire life. Words are very, very powerful. On the other hand, words are also extremely encouraging, can change the course of history. We know that, whether it's American history, world history, Israeli history, politics, whatever it is, we know that words are powerful. So I want to show you this that I came across. Share and go to this. Okay. If it's too loud, you have to let me know because I can't tell how loud or not it is. It'll be in English. Too deep. They'll never make it. No, never. The rain. Uh oh. No, the rain will fill the hole and then they can swim out. Stop jumping. We have a plan. Stop. We're going to wait for the rain to fill the hole. Why aren't you listening to them? You'll never make it! It's too high! You can't do it! It's too Listen deep! Listen to him! Save your strength! Don't even try! Just can't. lay down! stop it okay what's the point it's a cutesy way of showing that words are extremely powerful and Rav Shake is very well aware of this why didn't he just send a message you know write a you know it was very common those days to write we saw we even saw this in the in Sefer Shmuel when uh, David Amelech sends a letter to the battlefield to Uriah Hiti. Send a letter, send a, a um, you know, roll it up and with the seal and everything else. Because he understood that the power of the spoken word was, was that, exactly, it was powerful. Let's take a start. We're going to look with at Perak Yudchet, chapter 18, Pasuk Yudchet, Pasuk 18. <clears throat> so it's 18.18 in Malachim Bet. Okay, and pick it up from there. Vayikri'u. <clears throat> Ela Melech. Vayetse alehem Eliakim ben Chilkiyau asher labayit, veshevna sofer, vioach ben Asaf maskir. So they had called to the king to ask the king to come. Remember, they said to they, who had three people, Rav Shake was, was a third one, um, called to the king to come out. The king doesn't come, but instead, Eliakim, who was in charge of the house, of the house of the king, Shevna the scribe and Yoach, who was the secretary, whatever that meant at the time, they came out and stood to listen the word of Rav Shakeh. Vayomer alehem Rav Shakeh, and Rav Shakeh said to them, Imrunal Chizkiyahu, say to Chizkiyahu. Notice he doesn't use the appellation Hamelech Chizkiyahu, just Chizkiyahu. However, there is something kind of strange there. He says, Imru na. Na means please. So we're going to come back to that. Ko amara Melech. 
So as the king, the great king of Assyria said, Ma habitachon What is this security, safety that you are relying on? Amarta ach dvar svatayim. Until now, you basically just said words. He's, name, he's saying in the name of the king, I don't understand. You're a big talker, big shot, big deal. All you do is talk a big game, but now it's talkless time. And what kind of great ideas do you have for any kind of actual battle? Upon whom are you relying that you actually went ahead and rebelled against me. So first, let's take a look at a couple of slides. One, the first one is going to be a slide of the words of Rashi on this. Okay. Rashi says, "Amarta ach devar satayim, amarta adhena." You've said until now, "Lo evod lemelech Ashur." I will not serve the king of Assyria. Ach. That was just lip service or statements. As long as the king didn't actually leave Assyria to come against you, you needed no battle plan. You didn't need anyone to give you a, a, ideas of how to fight. But now, now that he's left and it's coming, you better get your ducks in a row and come up with some battle plan. Ata now, Emor, tell me, Ami batachta, upon whom have you been relying? So Rashi is telling us, what does that mean? Dvar really, he's saying the king is passing along a message to Rav Shakeh. He said, again, you talk a big game, but now it's tachless time. You, you better come up with something because I don't know who you've been relying on, but it's not going to help you. In addition to that, let's take a look at the words of... Um, a little bit smaller because I forgot I, I enlarged everything. Okay. This is the that's so free. Lifne kishlosh meot shana, approximately 300 years prior to this. Amad David mul Goliath aplishti hitvakech venilchamito. Goliath stood, sorry, David stood across from Goliath, uh, the plishti, an argument with him, fought with him. Ma'amad ze nishar kidugma le dorot. This particular instance. Um, stands as a uh, example for generations. It stood in stark contract as an avtipus or prototype of what it would be like for a person, a Jew, who has Hashem, that Hashem is going to save him on the one hand, and the non Jewish world or person who relies on his own power and might and his God's lowercase g. The, the dispute between his, the, the messengers of Melech Ashur and Chizkiyahu about God, is actually a continuation of this very same vikuach that took place between Goliath and David. There's actually certain things they have in common. He said that this, the case of Goliath, and this instance of Rav Shake, are continued prototypes or avtipus um, uh, paradigms of Jew versus non-Jew in the world. Take a look now in the text, please. We'll continue in Pasuk. Kafalaf, number 21. Atan now, Hine batachta lacha al mishenet hakane ratzutz haze al mitzrayim. You have until now relied, and he uses a very interesting mashal, which I read already when we saw this in Yeshayahu. You have been relying on a broken reed of mitzrayim. Asha yisamech ish Allah, that if a person were to really rely or rest up against a broken reed, it would go into his hands, and it would pierce it. So too is Paro, king of Egypt, to those who rely on him. He's giving the following mashal. He says, look, 
you're going to tell me that you've been relying on Egypt, the big, holy, special Egypt. But who are they? They're nothing but a broken reed. Now picture a reed. Let's just say it may be easier to picture like a, a, a piece of bamboo. And the bamboo is split. So when you put your hand and you rest on it, what you're doing essentially is you're going to stab yourself and pierce your skin, pierce your hand. He said that that's the mashal, that is the parable for you're relying on Egypt. You try to rely on Egypt, all it's going to do is come back and bite you. That's what it is. To what, to what extent were they relying on Egypt? Oh, very good. What do you think? What was it that they, what Egypt had? Um... They were known in the world, especially the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, and even way after. They were the Motown of their time. What is What was Motown? Motor Town, Detroit, Michigan. Music? No, besides that. Music the Supreme. Also. No, they had cars. <laughs> cars. <laughs> oh, okay. Egypt was the, the world center of horses. Horses was necess were necessary for battle. So they were relying either on the help of the mercenaries from Egypt and or the actual horses that they were getting from Egypt. Those were a couple of the possibilities. Did it state that in the text previously? I don't no. just don't remember that. No, it does no, not. It, it did not. Well, there's one time where they tried to engage Egypt to help them. Yes, there was mention of that briefly, but it wasn't expanded on very much. We're going to see in a minute a little bit more of it, though. But I want to talk for a minute about this mashal. The mashal, this parable, you could have used a million things. He could have said you're you're relying on a sword, you know, that you when you lean on a sword, it stabs you. What is this about a broken reed? Where's that coming from? I didn't find it anywhere. Anywhere. But I came up with an idea that I'd like to know what you think. Take a look at the next slide. And I'll show you what my idea is. Here we go. Torah tells us, the beginning of Parshat Nitzavim, Atem Nitzavim Mayom, well, the Pasuk is, Atem Nitzavim Mayom Kulchem, Hashechem, Shitechem, etc., etc., Kol Ish Yisrael. You are standing, all standing here today. And there are many commentaries of why the Torah says you are all standing here today. They were, it was just after they had all the terrible klalot, uh, or the curses, the tochacha that was said to them, all kinds of things. But, I'm not interested in that now. The Midrash Tanchuma tells us as follows. Mahayom meir, just like the day is bright or gives light, pa'amim at times, umafil pa'amim, and sometimes it's dark. Afatem, so too are you, Am Yisrael, kisha'afela lachem, when it's dark for you, nevertheless, atid lahair lachem or olam. Eventually you're going to, you'll be the, the light of the world will enlighten now, when is it that we're going to see this or, meaning the time of Mashiach? When you're going to be all united. Unfortunately, we are so far afield from that today. The Midrash doesn't say that I do. How do we know that Mashiach can only come if we're really united? It says, Chayim kulchem hayom. Benohag sheba. Okay, so it means chayim kulchem hayom, fine, whatever it means the first half. I want to read this, look at the second half of this midrash. Benohag sheba olam. In the normal course of business, of life. Im notel adam agudashel kanim. If a person were to take a whole bunch of reeds together, like a staff, then, and try to break them, shema yachol leshovram bevatachad. It's possible you might be able to break them. Chances are you won't. The more of them there are, chances are you're not going to break them, but you might. If you were to take one reed at a time, even a child could break one of those reeds. What is this Midrash telling us? Dafka uses the word kanan. I'm going to give you another reason why. It tells us, the, the, the mashal of explaining the concept of the unity of Am Yisrael is that when we're all together, all individuals, but we're, we're together, that nothing can break us because of that unity, just like you can't smash a whole bunch of reeds at one time. But when we're individuals, we're by ourselves, we can be smashed easily. So when we separate ourselves and we're fractious, 
That's when problems happen and continue. But why read? Again, why read? It could have been anything. It could have been so many other things that the Midrash could have used, so many other things that the that the, uh, the Rav Shakesh could have used. So there's another place I went looking for but just before class. I, I, I meant to make a slide, but I couldn't remember to find it. We're also compared to a reed for another reason. Reeds and um, like the Yam Suf um, is translated into English wrong. We know it's not the Red Sea because it's a Sufis of reeds. It's the reed C, we have Gutenberg to thank for that. Um, Amisal is compared to reeds for another reason. If you've ever been by the water where there are reeds, what happens when the wind blows them? A strong wind comes, blows them, but when the wind stops, they come right back to where they were. They're very resilient. It's the same thing with Amisal, which is why we're also compared to reeds because Amisal, when the, when the winds blow against us, when things happen, yes, sometimes we get knocked down, but we pop back up. So this whole concept is of, this, of using all these ideas of putting the reed together. So Rav Shake is using this very concept of the reed to remind Amisal, again, in my humble opinion, that yes, you might be compared to reeds and you might think you're going to bounce back, but the reed you're relying on right now is fractured and broken and it's going to pierce your hand in the mashal and that's relying on Egypt. So you're really, you're really toast. Okay. I'm going to continue reading in the text. And, um, oh, no, I'm not reading reads, the text. I have more to I have more. What's that? It was also reads that protected Moshe Rabbeinu. When also protected the... Moshe Rabbeinu. That's correct. There are a number of times it comes up. <clears throat> Very good. That's correct. Um, I'd, I'd like to just a small comment on when you said that Rav Shakeh said na to the <laughs> uh, na el yes. I didn't answer that yet. I agree with you that na is usually translated as please, but, but I'm using Tanakh with an English translation. Yes. And it says, speak now. Like Excellent. This guy, I'm, Excellent. Excellent. So hang on. To, more where does he get that, though? We're going to see. We're going to see that in a couple of minutes. Okay. Oh, very, very good. Very good. Thank you. Good call. Okay. Um, take, I'm going to leave the screen share on unless it bothers people. I'm going to leave it on for a couple more minutes here still. We're going to go now to Pasuk. Kafbet number 22. Rabbi? Yes. Could it be that um, he's saying that crossing a Yamsuf with a height of um, Kaddish Baruch Hu's glory and a Kaddish Baruch Hu's, he's referring to that and a Kaddish Baruch Hu is no longer relevant. The answer to that is actually in the very next Pasuk. Oh, I didn't learn he actually that. says okay. it straight out. You're correct. Okay, take a look. Very good call. Kafbet number 22. And maybe you want to say to me, You know what? I'll tell you, we're not relying on the Egyptians. We're relying on our God. So Rav Shake would find a problem with that um, claim. And he says, he says, wait a minute. You're very king, Chizkiyahu. One of the things he did was to remove the bamot, the high places, and the mizbachot, the altars, the private ones, which were meant to serve your God. Wait a minute. If that's the case, why? if you're relying on God, why did he take those away? Now, we know that he removed them because... They were they were asur. The bamot were asurot at this time now, at the time of the Beit Hamikdash. But from the perspective of Rav Shake, he saw the dismantling of the bamot as a rejection, at least partially, of the king of God. So you're going to tell me you relied on God, but you took away his altars. Does that make any sense? Keilu, that's what Rav Shake is saying. Um, I want to look. Let me see which one this is. Yeah, I want to take a look at the next slide, please. Okay, there is a three words that come before this slide. I didn't feel like putting a slide with three words, so let me just read them to you. From the words of Rav Shakeh, we reveal, or it is revealed that 
פרטים ממה שאמר ועשה חזקיהו בזמן שטיהר את הארץ. From the words of Rav Shake, we see some more details about what Chizkiyahu did at the time he purified the land. The altars and the high places that were in Yehuda were actually meant for Hashem. They were L'Shem Shemayim. But they were against the Torah. Because once the Beit HaMikdash was established in the place where Hashem chose, as I said, it would have been prohibited to bring korbanot on Bamot. So therefore, Chizkiyahu commanded to destroy them. No, technically, it would have been prohibited to actually destroy Bamot that were meant for Shem Hashem. At the time when it was permitted to have Bamot, there were no Bamot that existed at this point that had been built prior to the Beit HaMikdash, which meant the old ones that would have been around, maybe you would not have been able to destroy. But those that were built from the time after the Beit HaMikdash was built, those were allowed to be destroyed because they were Asur to begin with, even though they were L'Shem Shamayim. Even if they had been leftovers, it was decided to destroy them too to prevent any michshol or stumbling block. Now, you say yourself, like, wait a minute, how's Rav Shakay know this? He's coming all the way from Assyria. It's not like they had a WhatsApp group with the king. Says, How does he know? So it says that this act, these actions of Chizkiyahu were even well known among the non-Jewish people, because there were still plenty of them in Israel. The, 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 this, the word came to the king of Assyria that this was happening. Okay, so what's happening here is that Rav Shake is turning around the action of the king on himself, saying, you're going to tell me you rely on Egypt? Give me a break. They're, they're, they're going to hurt you more than they're going to help you. You're going to tell me you rely on, on God? Give me another break. You can't be that religious and believing in God if you took his very own bamot and destroyed them, because after all, the Jews were using them to serve God. So I don't understand what you're really trying to tell me here. Look at, now let's take a look now, please, at Pasuk Kaf Gimel. 23. Now, let's make a bet, a deal. With the word et, besides being the, the showing that it, it, you're, the, it is the object of, of an action, it also means with. We see this throughout Tanakh. Aleph Taf also means with. Let's make a bet with my king, with the king of Ashur. And if I give you, were to give you 2,000 horses, if you were able to put to actually have enough soldiers to put upon them, next pasuk, with all those horses and all those men, you know where I'm going, it's not going to be talking about Humpty Dumpty. If you were able to wipe out or to kill even just one of my captains, ain't going to happen. This is where I told you it comes back clearly now. And you relied on Egypt for chariots and, and ho for horses, or well, the implications horses, but for chariots and for runners? Give me a break. Now, what has happened? He started off making fun of them as belief for relying on Egypt. Then he went to the fact that there's no chance you could be really relying on God because give me another break. Look what you what you physically done. Now he's saying I'll make you this bet. That you, you know, I'll give you I'll give you the horses. You just put the runner, but people on there. You ain't gonna do anything to even one of my guys. And in the meantime, you keep saying that you're relying on the Egyptians for their their um, weapons of war. I don't think so. If that's the case. Look in Pasuk Cafe twenty five. Atanal. You know what? 
I don't need this argument. I don't need to tell you about Egypt. I don't need to tell you about the Bamot. I don't need to tell you that that I'm uh, making this bet because I have a perfect reason why I'm going to win this. God himself sent me to destroy this place. Hashem Amar Eli, God said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Wow. It's pretty strong stuff. So now let's take a look at Rashi, which is in the next slide. What does this mean? Hashem. Who said, by the way, Mi Amar El Mi? Who said to whom? Bil Adai. It was like a whole implication of just that one word. It's in the Torah. It's in, Par- in Sefer Breshit. Bil Adai. Mi Amar El Mi. Quick Tanakh quiz. And you, if you win, you just get a clap. That's all. When Yosef HaTzadik is taken out of the pit, mentioned this just the other day in a different class, and Yosef HaTzadik is taken out of the pit and he's brought before Paro. And Paro says, hey, I hear that you're the big guy. You're the head honcho when it comes to dream interpretation. And Yosef replies with the word, Biladai. Nothing to do with me. Only Hashem is able to answer the, what means behind dreams. Okay? What does this mean over here, though? Let's see what Rashi says. Ha mi baladei Hashem. He asks in a rhetorical way. What? I came with no permission. You think I'm that stupid? Remember, we're dealing with a, 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 um, a mumar. This man, according to most opinions, Rav Shakei, was Jewish, who turned against the Jewish people himself. And we've noted before that some of our worst enemies in Jewish history were our own people who went off the derech in the most <laughs> literal sense. But he still had the, the acknowledgement to some extent of Hashem, knew the power of God. He said, what are you talking about? You think I would come here with no permission from God himself? So Rashi says, Kfar Yishayahu. Yishayahu was already given the prophecy as follows. In the days of Achaz, your father, Yavi Hashem Alecha Ve'al Ammecha, that Hashem will bring upon you and your people at Melech Ashur. It was already stated by the prophet Yeshayahu before you, one generation back, that Hashem was going to send the king of Assyria against your land. Well, wait a minute. It's already ordained? I don't understand. So you're telling me that Yeshayahu prophes- gives prophecy that Hashem says the king of Assyria is going to come to your land and he's going to come and destroy it. Okay, so what, what Rav Shake is doing, he's saying, I told you so, God sent me, I'm on a mission from God. But that also sounds like predestination, predetermination. That God already determined the fate of the Jewish people, hundreds, uh, not hundreds, but quite a long time before it actually occurred. He's, he's writing on the coattails of Isaiah's prophecies. That's what he's exactly what he's doing. But back then, when Yeshayahu said this, doesn't that also kind of do something about the and free choice? What happened to that? What happened to free choice? I mean, shouldn't this, they just basically have given up and said, oh yeah, you're right. You know what? Isaiah did say that. I remember him telling dad, Okay, let's go, guys. But we know for, for 130 years, there's a, like a continuation of Malchei Yehuda still. Malchut Yehuda, Slicha. Couldn't it be the Yeshayahu was thinking that if you continue on this Kav, then you would, but there's always their, their, their option Absolutely. to, to Absolutely. change the narrative. Absolutely. There is, that's, that's, that's the best answer that I could give right now, that if this is a not a fait accompli, it's not a fait accompli as long as you don't change your ways. You don't change. If you don't change your ways, then you guys are toast. That's correct. Um, as a parenthetical statement, and I talk about this in the Kuzari class last week, I want to mention something about this idea of what's called predetermination versus free choice, which is not something that's an easy topic to deal with because it's very, very, very deep. Um, one of the best examples of 
which has to do with, wait a minute, if Hashem knows everything, doesn't he already know what I did in the future? So therefore, what kind of free choice do I have? Which sounds like a little bit of twisted logic, but let's go with that. So I heard the following mashal, I thought it was excellent. What would happen if a person was born and that there was a con there was a, um, a machine that could videotape this child from the day he's born to the day he died and record everything he saw, did, felt, every action he took. Now, on the day he died, this video was then taken back in time by a time traveler and then handed to the parents prior to this child being born. Does that mean the child did these things because of the videotape? No. It's a video of what ended up happening. Just so happens that Hashem is a time traveler because time Hashem is not bound by time. So therefore, just because Hashem knows what's going to happen doesn't mean we don't have the options to change that. That's also a different discussion. It still means that we have the free choice to do it. Fine. I don't want to talk about this anymore, but I want to stay on this pasuk for a minute. So what, Chizki, so what Rav Shakeh is doing is informing the king, Chizkiah, through these three people, saying to them, that um, everything else I've said, yeah, 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 yes, is true. But bottom line, I'm here because God told me to come here. Let's take a look at the next pasuk. Kafvav. Vayome Eliakim ben Chilkiyahu. And I didn't forget, I'm going to come back to this na, maybe still tonight. I think so. Vayome, by the way, the word na means one other thing. It doesn't just mean please. It doesn't just mean now, which is actually Targum Yonatan. What else does it mean? It's one more thing. Raw. Raw. This week's Parsha. My Bar Mitzvah Parsha. Right. So, yeah. You mustn't right. have it raw. Right. Yeah. right. You can't eat it raw. So na also means raw. Go figure that the letters nun aleph means raw, now, and also means please. That's its own shear, I'm sure. Okay. Pasuk Kaf Vav, 26. <clears throat> so now you have Eliakim, Shevna, and, and Yoach. They're, 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 they're shaking in their boots. They're really nervous. And not only are they nervous, they're nervous that everyone else around them is hearing this pro proclamation from Rav Shakeh. Kaf Vav. Vayomer Eliakim ben Chilkiyo v'Shevna v'Yoach el Rav Shakeh. All three of them then turn to Rav Shakeh and say, Hey, do me a favor. Talk in Aramaic. We'll understand. Don't talk in Hebrew, which is what Rav Shake was speaking in, because the people around here on the wall all hear you. We don't want them to hear. That's Dafka what he wants, though, which we'll see in the next Pasuk. Um... That's how this pasuk should be translated, at least. Right? This is how you translate it. He says to his, to please speak to your servants. Sorry, speak to your servants, meaning themselves in Aramaic, because we can hear you and understand. Meaning, we'll understand that. Don't speak to us in Yehudit in Hebrew. within the hearing of people of the average person, Asher al Hachoma that are on the wall that are all listening in on this wall, okay. What else might this mean? Let me take a look at the next slide. Okay. This is a Rashi on, is, um, in Sefer Yeshayahu with the same words. Remember, the same story, same narrative appears in Yishayahu with some modifications. So he says over there, uh, over there it says, Elenu Yehudit, here it says, Imanu. This is what Rashi says on those words. Don't talk to us in Hebrew. Shekol ha'am makirim belashon Yehudit. All the people knew Hebrew. And they're getting scared by what you're saying. Now, you'll notice a parenthetical comment by Rashi. These are not my parentheses. These are Rashi's parentheses. The shamar lahem, because he, Rav Shake, said in the beginning, imru na el chizkiyahu, please say to chizkiyahu, savru, they thought, shelo ba lahav 
that they were not coming <clears throat> to make the people afraid. The Rav Shakeh Yisrael Mumar Haya, and Rav Shakeh was an apostate, because Savurim Ahem, Av Shemitzvat Rabo, a Rav Shakeh, Aval Libonim Shach Le Mishpachto, Vich Meru Nichumav. Rashi has a very different potential meaning of this pasuk. He says as follows. Because we do know that Rav Shakeh was an apostate, maybe, just maybe, when he tells them to speak in Aramaic and not Hebrew, was because he didn't realize the power of his words were really getting the people scared. And these three people who knew he was an apostate, when Rav Shakeh first showed up, he said, please say to Chizkiyahu. And that please, that imru na, please say, had the implication of like, I really don't want to be the one saying this, but my king sent me. And by the besides which, the implication is that my family still lives here in Israel. And I have some, my, some mercy on them. So they say to him, look, if you don't want people to be afraid and you want to be imru na, then, then why don't you do me the favor, please, of... Wait. I got okay. Well, I got the the feeling that you really don't want people to be afraid from what you're saying. So then, calm down and change into Aramaic so people won't hear you. If that's your game plan, if it's the imuna of the positive of please, then like, hey, change your approach, guy. But that's a parenthetical statement of Rashi. That's not necessarily what's really going on. Yonatan said, as was pointed out, that not in this case is now, immediately. So he, in that first pasuk, he is deriding and making fun of their king by calling him just Chizki Yahu. I'll give you an example of why that sounds so bad. My wife and I went just less than two weeks ago, oh, two weeks ago, for our first corona shot. And right behind us, three weeks ago, Three weeks, three weeks ago for our Corona shot. And the person behind us in line was Rav Elisha Aviner. And the, the Sadranit, the one who was calling people to come next, kept going, Elisha, 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 I'm cringing. It's like, no, he's at least with Fachot Rav Elisha. So I wanted to say something, I decided whatever, because he'd be upset with me if I said something, he'd know I'd say something because I'm standing right there. So I didn't, but just to hear that the lack of respect and the Torah, the title Harav missing from his name, it really got under my skin and my wife's skin. So here you are talking about the king of Israel who has a halacha as follows. We know that a, a father, a Rav, um, a Rav shemachala kvodo, kvodo machul, that a Rav can say, no, I don't need to be the one to bench. I don't need to, don't have to stand up for me. Uh, a parent can say, you don't have to stand up for me. That's fine. But a melech, a king is not allowed to have to overlook his 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 uh, honor. If, if they if they have to stand up for the king, and if they don't, it's treason. Or it's not the right word. It's morid um, b'malchut. Um, so now he's just dropping the title, and then he says imuna el In this case, according to Targum Yonatan, it meant. Now, I want, don't just, just, just hear me out and just go, go, okay, I'm going to go home and have a cup of coffee, watch the game, and then I'll tell the king, you better go and tell him immediately. So it was just, you know, sticking into him and sticking into him and sticking to him. Um, but calling her up Elisha, Elisha was still better than what my experience was. was. Yeah. We were numbers. At least he had a name. We were numbers. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Good and it point. was even worse when I went for my second one because... There was a Sadranit standing at the entrance who was tearing off the numbers for you and giving them to you, not letting you do it yourself. Oh, wow. And so she gave me, and it was 349. And then I look at the screen to see who's next, and it's 360. What? So I said, well, excuse me, I'm not going to get a turn because it's past 349. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So she starts pulling all the numbers out. And until she gets to 360, she says, go. So I didn't have to wait at all. Oh, my God. <laughs> It was weird, really weird. Very. Okay, take a look, please, now so at Pasuk Kazayin, number 27. Vayome Alehem Rav Shakeh. Rav Shakeh said back to them, and this will support the other opinion, not the Rashi in parentheses. Ha'al Adonecha ve'lecha shlachani Adoni. 
You think the king sent me to speak to the three of you guys? To say this? It is the people who are here sitting on the wall. Loosely translated, that is your people who are here sitting, eating the dung and urine. What does that even mean? And it, the implication was that two things. One, I'm here to scare the bejeebers out of all the people. And number two, I'm also here, they're in such terrible shape. There's such terrible famine that they're eating their own body waste. I'm going to move the computer over to the couch for a couple of minutes to plug in because I'm about to, so I'm going to put the screen down a little bit so you don't get dizzy when I'm moving it around. Hold on one second. <laughs> Ten, ten, nine. 